Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the IIB Summit on Diversity, Equality, and Inclusion, where we will explore what foreign banks operating in the United States can do individually and collectively to support inclusive growth, both in their institutions and in the communities they serve. IIB members have long been committed to promoting diversity, equality, and inclusion, as you'll undoubtedly hear from our impressive member bank speakers today. But the events of the past few months, the global reaction to the murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and Amon Arbery, the recognition of the disproportionate health and economic impact of the pandemic on minorities, and the long overdue rejection of the Confederate flag have prompted us to ask with greater urgency, how can we do more? How can we do better? Not just talk, but action. We seek answers to these questions because it is the right thing to do. But since we are in the business of finance, we should also note that it is good for business. In fact, research has shown a linear relationship between racial and ethnic diversity on senior executive teams and better financial performance. And banks, with their ability to be vectors of change across all types of customers and sectors of the economy, have a special responsibility to promote diversity, equality, and inclusion. I'm pleased to now turn to Tom Naritol, co-president of Global Wealth Management and president UBS Americas to introduce our keynote speaker, NCUA chairman Rodney Hood. Tom, thank you for being with us today and for your longstanding efforts at UBS to focus on these issues and bring about change. The floor is yours. Thank you, Bridget, and good afternoon, everyone. It's, it's certainly an honor to be here with all of you virtually and to help kick off this conversation on a topic that's really of critical importance to all of us. And I do want to thank uh, Bridget and the IIB team for bringing us all together to exchange ideas and to challenge each other on the ways that we can all meaningfully contribute uh, to the drive towards greater equality and opportunity. Now, over the past several weeks, many of us have taken a hard look at our business practices and at the values that define our organizations. The killings of George Floyd and Ahmed Arbery and other race-related incidents, including the Amy Cooper event, have stirred a reckoning with our nation's past and present. They've sparked a global discussion about the historical and structural elements of racism that still exist today. And importantly, they've also amplified the urgent calls for a brighter, fairer, and more equitable future. For a company like UBS, one with a powerful brand and an ability to influence change, we recognize our responsibility to support that vision. And I know that's a commitment that all of you share as well. In fact, that's why we're all here today. With nearly 21,000 employees in the United States, UBS is among the largest foreign banking organizations. That means we have to be a leader. Our people, our clients, and our communities demand and deserve that. Now, like many of you, we're not starting from square one. At UBS, we're proud that earlier this year, we became the only the second financial services company to publicly release a diversity and inclusion impact report, underscoring our commitment to transparency and accountability. In recent weeks, we've taken additional steps, including publicly establishing more aggressive goals for hiring, developing, promoting a more diverse workforce, as well as making additional significant commitments to improve outcomes for communities of color. I'm also proud of the culture As foreign banks, each with a significant presence in the US, we're approaching this challenge from a position of both strength and weakness. Although not comparable in any way to the discrimination and isolation one would feel if you were being judged by the color of your own skin, as employees and leaders of international banks, we can all recognize the damage and the hurt that can be inflicted by making someone feel different or lesser or other. 
Uh, we've all been cut out of conversations by language or culture. And we've all seen how biases that exist in large organizations can make people feel excluded and disadvantaged. That experience in no way reflects the prejudice and discrimination that have held Black and African Americans back for centuries. But it can help to inform our own recognition of what's right, what's wrong, and how we can lead our organizations forward. It also reminds us that a one-size-fits-all global approach to diversity and inclusion is often impractical, as topics and contexts in one country may be less relevant or less understandable in another. Even the terminology that's used to describe issues in front of us can vary from the US to Europe to Asia. That's certainly the case with race and ethnicity, and in particular when it comes to the context that's needed to understand the history of violence and oppression faced by Black and African Americans. That's not to say our colleagues in other regions don't care or don't get it, because the overwhelming majority of them do. But if you're a person outside of the US with an ethnic background other than white, and even if you're not ethnically diverse, you're watching what's going on in the US and you're looking for answers. You're looking to the US for leadership and to catalyze change that has the potential to make a global impact. So as foreign banks, what's our unique opportunity? To start, we should look to our shared tradition of innovation, disruption, and challengers to the status quo. Organizations like ours have long been at the leading edge of efforts to reshape our industry. Our comparable sizes to our larger US peers have always given us the ability to be more nimble and more experimental in how we tackle our toughest challenges. We've risen to the occasion in the past and we can do so again. Likewise, our broad international footprints mean that we already appreciate the value of diverse organizations. It's a competitive advantage that makes us more effective in meeting our clients and our customers' needs. But to achieve scale and the kind of impact that will inspire others to act, we have to band together in a coordinated way. Many of our US peers have bigger balance sheets, bigger wallets, and have been focused on these issues for far longer than us. That sets the bar even higher for us, and yet it's a challenge we can't avoid to address head on. We need to approach this with the same energy we've used to challenge and outperform our domestic competitors. Data-driven decision-making, a commitment to transparency and accountability, disciplined execution of our strategies, and a willingness to be bold. These are the qualities that have driven our success and forced others to rethink their own business models, and they're the same principles that can help us set a new standard for our industry, whether it's investments in our talent, or working in our communities to ensure that capital, access, and opportunity are more widely available. We can build on our traditional strengths to drive meaningful and measurable progress and become the model to which others compare themselves. Now, there are no easy fixes. The tragedies we've seen in too many of our communities and the resulting outrage have galvanized our country and compelled our industry to act. Our challenge will be to sustain and channel this energy, to dismantle the structural impediments, to widen available opportunity, and to prove to those that say this time is different, that they're right. Succeeding will take relentless focus, it will take deliberate action, and it will take leadership with courage. Conversations like the one we'll have today are a critical part of the way we'll elevate the best ideas and how we'll hold each other accountable on this journey. Leadership on this issue will come and take many forms from the C-suite to functional management to grassroots employee-led efforts. It will also take leadership from our nonprofit and government partners, leaders like our keynote speaker this afternoon. The Honorable Rodney E. Hood is chairman of the National Credit Union Administration, an independent federal agency that oversees the activities of our nation's credit unions. Under Chairman Hood's leadership, the NCUA provides depository insurance, consumer protection, and regulatory oversight for a network of over 5,000 credit unions that provide banking and lending services to more than 100 million individuals and small business owners nationwide. As NCUA board chairman, Mr. Hood also serves as a voting member on the Financial Stability Oversight Council. He also represents the NCUA on the Federal Financial Institutions Examination Council and the Financial and Banking Information Infrastructure Committee. Chairman Hood has dedicated his career to connecting underbanked and underrepresented communities with the services they need to save, borrow, and invest for a better future. He's held leadership roles in the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Rural Housing Service, as well as JP, at J.P. Morgan Chase, Wells Fargo, and Bank of America. His commitment to expanding financial inclusion and creating a fairer, more equitable financial services industry 
makes him an authority on why diversity matters to all of us. It's also why I'm excited to hear and to learn from him today. So again, I wanna thank the IIB for bringing us together and all of, your, all of you for your ongoing commitment to our shared goals. And it's now my pleasure to hand things over to the Chairman of the National Credit Union Administration, the Honorable Rodney E. Hood. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you very much, Tom, for that very kind introduction. And thank you all for joining us today. It's indeed my pleasure to be here, at least virtually, to discuss several urgent issues that are at the forefront of our minds. I'm grateful to the Institute of International Bankers for hosting this summit, which comes at an incredibly welcome and impactful time for all of us. As Shakespeare once said, three hours too soon is better than one minute too late. Over the course of just a few short months, we now find ourselves in a very different world. Indeed, the world we knew in January now seems like the distant past. Over the last six months, we faced a series of challenges with global implications. First, of course, the coronavirus pandemic has tragically taken hundreds of thousands of lives worldwide and placed a tremendous strain on public health systems and social life. Second, there is great uncertainty resulting from the pandemic's economic repercussions and because there are so many unknowns, many companies are finding it challenging, to say the least, to provide financial forecasts and outlooks. Third, the tragic murder of George Floyd is yet another example of abuse of authority against a black man, and indeed has brought uncomfortable issues about race and class to the forefront of our public discourse. For those in leadership positions, including most, if not everyone on this call, any one of these crises would have been difficult enough to manage, to say nothing of having all three strike simultaneously. What I find interesting about these three distinct challenges, however, is that they all, in one way or another, are forcing us to confront the inequities that exist within our global society. Here in the United States, African-American, Latino, and all communities of color are being affected disproportionately by the spread of the coronavirus. Likewise, minority-owned businesses have been particularly affected by the suddenness and depth of the economic shock. And the protests throughout the American cities have revealed the pain, frustrations, and anger that have long been simmering throughout the Black community. And it's important to note, ladies and gentlemen, that none of these inequities are unique to the United States. Indeed, I'm sure many of you are witnessing similar dynamics in your own countries and local communities. So the question we must ask ourselves today is, what can we do to remedy these inequities? For those of us who work in and around the financial services industry, this is an especially urgent question because critics often cite our industry as one of the drivers of inequity. I have spent my entire career working with financial firms in the private sector or on regulatory issues in the public sector. So I know from firsthand experience that the financial services industry is often mischaracterized, if not downright maligned unfairly. At the same time, however, we must recognize that our industry has failed to live up to its highest ideals at times. That pains me when it happens because it undermines trust and feeds that misguided critique of our industry. The financial industry I've known for over two decades is a creative force that solves problems. It's the free market that drives capital to the best ideas. It helps people save and invest for retirement. It, it helps that newly married couple buy their first home. I've seen how the financial services industry plays a key role in helping families to achieve a financial freedom they need by building generational wealth, helping entrepreneurs to get their small businesses off the ground, and helping to create jobs and strengthen communities. Critical to each of these aforementioned goals is a healthy, vibrant financial services sector. It's time to start telling a new story about the financial services industry's com contributions to society. And just to be clear, I'm not suggesting another shiny marketing or public relations campaign. Rather, I'm talking about taking action to realize what's best in this industry through service to your clients and stakeholders. 
That story and that action must focus on the values of financial inclusion, bringing more people into the mainstream financial system. One of the things I passionately believe is that financial inclusion is indeed the civil rights issue of our time. If we get this right, if we create conditions where people can break the cycle of debt and dependency, obtain capital, and achieve financial security for themselves and their families, then I believe many problems will ultimately take care of themselves. This isn't a new commitment for me. It's something I've been working on since I began working in finance. Earlier in my career, I worked on community investment issues in the private sector with a heavy emphasis on financial inclusion and shared prosperity. Over the years and in various ways, that commitment has continued in my public service career today. I currently lead the independent financial regulatory agency that oversees the United States system of federally insured credit unions and financial inclusion is indeed a central part of my agenda here. What I'd like to do today is give a brief overview of how the financial industry can encourage and incentivize financial inclusion. And I'll say at the onset that it's not an exhausting list or exhaustive for that matter. Rather, it's a set of guiding principles we can use to achieve greater financial inclusion. First, we, we all need real institutional commitment on the values of diversity, equity, and inclusion, which I'll call DEI for short. I'm sure everyone here well knows why DEI is so important. We have endless numbers of studies and surveys stretching back at least three decades, making the, the strategic business case for DEI. In 2018, for instance, McKinsey and Company published its Insights on Diversity and Inclusion Report, which found that across the board, companies committed to the values of diversity, equity, and inclusion outperform the competition. According to the report, diverse companies were better at attracting and retaining top talent. They enjoyed superior financial performance, including profitability. They had higher levels of employee satisfaction and engagement. Far too often, organizations and executive leaders treat diversity as simply a human resources function and issue. To be truly effective, however, diversity must be more than that these that we're seeing these values require a commitment to cultural change at every level and must extend throughout the entire organization. It cannot be simply a matter of checking the boxes to show that you've got the right proportional representation of women, people of color, and LGBTQ plus people in the C-suite or on your corporate board. A commitment to a strong DEI program must inform all of the organization's strategic planning and operations. For the financial services industry in particular, diversity is vital when it comes to reaching and serving a wider, wider range of people. That's why we must consider diversity in a much more expansive way beyond the standard categories. For example, we must ask ourselves, are we doing everything we can to reach people with a low and moderate income? Are we including disabled and differently abled individuals in our financial inclusion plans? What about people in hard-pressed urban communities, or conversely, people in distressed rural communities where financial service options are thin on the ground? Each one of us should be thinking critically about these and other questions because they are at the core of true financial inclusion. Second, we must use financial technology in ways that will result in greater financial inclusion. I recognize that all of your member institutions are looking at how FinTech can be used to improve efficiency or customer service, especially as the pandemic has driven increasing numbers of banking customers into a digital world. But let's not forget that FinTech tools can also enable us to connect with minority communities, rural communities, and other underserved populations. There are tremendous opportunities here, so let's continue the great work our industry is already doing on that front and build upon it. For example, in West Africa, the World Council of Credit Unions, through its Technology and Innovation for Financial Inclusion Project, is working with the Confederation of Financial Institutions of West Africa to create a digital credit union. By exploring opportunities for partnership with technology and business development providers, the project's goals is to explore and to improve small and medium enterprise lending strategies in developing countries of the world. Third, we need continued innovation in financial products that promote greater inclusion. 
The financial services industry has shown great creativity in developing new types of products, but we haven't always directed those creative energies towards helping people and communities who need help the most. That, however, seems to be changing for the better, and social impact investing is an excellent example of that change. For example, not too long ago, we saw the launch of a new exchange traded index fund in the United States markets that focuses on investing in companies with a strong racial and ethnic diversity policy in place to encourage investment in companies that are leading the way in the charge of diversity. That's a compelling and interesting business approach. I'm also, ladies and gentlemen, interested to see other types of social impact investing that could help support underserved urban populations or encourage investment in distressed rural areas. And I'd like to see that same spirit of innovation put to work on behalf of microfinance projects or alternative lending products that will help us to put other unbanked and underbanked population, populations on the road to prosperity and financial freedom. Earlier in my remarks, I mentioned that most of my work these days is with credit unions, and I encourage all of you to closely examine what the credit union industry is doing on these issues. Here in the United States, the credit union industry has more than 120 million members. That's roughly one third of the American population is represented with our credit unions, with assets now of over $1.6 trillion. And though these are cooperative member-owned financial institutions that differ in many ways from your business models, one thing I believe we can learn from credit unions is how impactful a strong commitment to community service and community development can truly be. This embodies the people helping people ethos that has long guided the credit union industry since its inception nearly a century ago. Over the last 18 months or so, I've logged countless hours and miles visiting credit unions throughout the United States and talking with credit union leaders, volunteers, and staff. The collaborations I've seen virtually everywhere I go are very powerful. And that collaboration is the key to achieving real financial inclusion. And while I've spoken today about broad issues, what we're truly talking about here is having an impact on real people. That's the goal, right? Last year, I spoke with a woman in Maryland who had been excluded from the financial system for most of her adult life. After joining a credit union and participating in a financial coaching program, she built over time a credit score that enabled her to obtain access to mainstream financial products. Today, I've learned that she's on the road to financial freedom and home ownership. That's just one example, but I could point to scores of others. Here's quite frankly, the bottom line. When we talk about addressing inequities that are hurting our global societies, we must move beyond offering soothing platitudes and ethereal pie in the sky statements of support. What we must focus on instead is action. We must focus on what we can do to address those inequities. We must identify and implement solutions at a concrete level within our realm of influence to make the changes we need to see that we want to see. The famous Russian writer Leo Tolstoy once said, everyone thinks of changing the world, but no one thinks of changing himself. What I appreciate in that thought is its humility, the idea that if one wants to make a true change, they, they must indeed begin with their own sphere of influence where they can make the biggest difference. But once you make that change, it will inevitably have a larger reverberation throughout all areas of the world. I believe it's time that we make that true change within the financial industry, and that change begins with a true sustained commitment to financial inclusion. But we can't simply sit back and wait for someone else to come along and fix it. It begins with leadership, and it begins with recapturing the best sense of finance as a force for good that's innovative, productive, constructive, and dedicated to problem solving and making a positive difference in our world. I look forward to working with all of you in partnership to bring that vision to fruition. In closing, I'll leave with a quote from a former banker who has now answered a higher call to serve, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, and I'll quote, we do not have the luxury of saying something must be done without doing anything ourselves. 
thank you to the Institute of International Bankers for the various gracious invitation to join you today. I hope to hear and learn more about your great work in the days ahead as we each do our level best to make the global world in which we operate a place where financial inclusion takes place and where all individuals can have access to shared prosperity. Thank you once again. I've enjoyed being with you. Thank you so much, Chairman Hood, for those inspiring remarks and a concrete call to action. Hoping you have time for one or two questions that audience members have submitted. Oh, yes, please. Um, so first, I'd like to ask, given your professional background, personal background, and now as a regulator, um, what do you look for when um, assessing, I don't you know, mean in a formal way, but lo looking at firms' um, DEI programs, and <clears throat> what kind of changes might you be looking for in response to the events that you, you know, just um, uh, talked about in your, in your remarks? Oh, thank you. And that's a really timely question, Bridget. What we're looking for is, first of all, in the credit unions that we oversee, we have a number of credit unions that are completely dedicated to being minority depository institutions. We call them in America MDIs. So we're working to make sure that first and foremost, that those institutions are equipped with the resources and tools they need to really be there for the communities of color that truly need access to affordable financial services. We're giving grants around mentoring opportunities. We're also working on workshops and things of that nature because if there's any group that can really be hands on the ground or foot on the ground, it will be our MDIs. But we also have credit unions that are low income designated, which means they have decided that they're going to devote most of their resources to helping low to moderate income communities have access. So we are empowering those. But to your question of what are we doing around the diversity piece, we are implementing a diversity and inclusion survey within the National Credit Union Administration. And what we're hoping to do by that we want to know baseline. I can't know what my diversity numbers are if our credit unions aren't filling out the voluntary self-assessment to tell us about minority staffing levels, minority procurement levels, and minority board composition. So we've gotten a number of responses to that. So now we're trying to at least get a baseline so we can then offer opportunities for people to grow and develop, grow and develop. develop. But again, it's around getting the baseline. And also one of the areas that we've been emphasizing, we don't hear a lot of folks talk about minority supplier diversity. So just as we wanna have a workforce that reflects uh, the change in demographic shifts, we also wanna retain that workforce, but we also wanna do business with folks who reflect the business communities that we serve. And that means, are we looking at having diverse spending? Are we having goals? We at NCUA, I can say that 43% of our spend is with minority and diverse suppliers. Buyers. So that's another area that I encourage individuals to look at, and we continue to advocate for that. Another area in my comments that I mentioned is to really look at diversity holistically. And what I mean by that, and inclusion holistically, we often tend to think of it by looking at ethnic communities and low to moderate income, but are we thinking about disabled or folks who are differently abled? And are we looking at LGBTQ+, so really looking at a whole panoply of groups that really comprise inclusion. So those are just some of the things we're doing. And if I can close, when I talk about building a diverse workforce, I want to make sure that as we at NCA are building a diverse workforce, that means that we are changing how we go about recruiting. It means that we're not just going to the institutions, institutions of yesteryear. It may mean now if you want minorities, well, you go to the minority serving colleges and universities where they tend to go. So that means partner with groups uh, that serve those populations. It also means doing internship programs. We, for the first time, have partnered with a group that works with underserved communities to bring those individuals into NCUA at the high school level so that they can, in turn, learn about working in our environment, giving them the tools and techniques they need, not just to get them through high school and eventually college, but as I tell them, who knows, maybe you all can become the next chairman of the NCUA someday, but let's focus on diversity recruiting, but also inclusion meaning are we giving them an environment where they feel comfortable bringing their true and authentic selves to work once they enter the workplace? So I've created a cultural inclusion council. So we have folks now who are giving me a temperature gauge on what have been the barriers to inclusion that may have existed. How do we eradicate those barriers? So each and every day, this talented workforce that I'm creating, I wanna retain them and you do that through making them feel valued and authenticated. 
That's great. Chairman Hood, I really, um, I, and I know I speak on behalf of the IIB and I'm confident I speak on behalf of all our members to say that we would look for opportunities to learn from your data, learn from your experience and partner with you on some of these um, innovative programs that you're instituting both at your, you know, at, at the um, agency as well as through your members. So we'll stay in touch. Please so do. Hit 2.30, we have our panel. We welcome you to stay for that, but I really want to thank you again for your time and for your extraordinary leadership in pushing the financial services to industry to meet this challenge. And before we take a quick break, I need to read out our CLE code for everyone who needs that. It's 49225. Again, the CLE code is 49225. And we will return in five minutes to hear from our distinguished panelists. Thank you again, Chairman Hood, and thank you, Tom. Thank you. I've enjoyed being with you. Can all the panelists um, turn on their cameras so we can make sure we have you all and do a quick Ali? Hello, Aaron, nice to see Hi, you. Hi, Bridget, nice to see you. Marvina, hello, Vinay. Hi. Hey, that's great. And hi, Patsy's on as well. If you can see me, I, I can. Now I can. I was just okay. texting. Where's Patsy? <laughs> I'm here. Okay, <laughs> good. <Sorry. laughs> How's it was good this afternoon? Pretty good. Pretty good. All good. This is a good way to test the sound as well. So thanks for asking the question, Ali. <laughs> Great. Okay. I I think we are ready to go. Is that right, Megan? Okay. All right, showtime. Very good. Well, welcome back, everyone. I'm very excited for our next session. Foreign banks have long embraced DEI as important goals at home, globally, and of course, here in the United States. Our panelists are leaders in promoting diversity and inclusion at their institutions and in our industry. Thanks to their work, bolstered by the support of their senior management, IIB members are making significant progress in diversity, but we, like our U.S. bank peers, still struggle with retaining and advancing our minority and women colleagues into executive and senior level ranks, and we also face challenges in achieving full financial inclusion in our customer base. Our goal today is to listen and learn from our panelists and take away from this session some actionable items that we can use to advance transparency and accountability in our collective progress. 
I'd like to begin this part of our program by asking each of our panelists to briefly introduce themselves, their roles and backgrounds. I want to note we did have one last minute change. Gopal Bonzel, who was originally scheduled to be on the panel from RBC, had a last minute conflict, but his colleague, Ali Najafi, has graciously agreed to join us today. So let's do introductions in alphabetical order, and that begins with A, Ali. who we've lost. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, how about if we, let's see, I guess E. Aaron is next. <laughs> Good afternoon. Thank you, Bridget. And thanks to the IIB team for the invitation to join today's panel for such an important discussion. I'm Aaron Preston, the Chief Compliance Officer for NAB Securities, the broker dealer entity for National Australia Bank. When I'm not focused on my core responsibilities as the Chief Compliance Officer, I'm an active member of the Gender Diversity Committee and active in planning the women's NAB leadership events for the New York office. My previous roles have been general counsel, chief compliance officer, and for a time and point, head of HR for various broker dealers. Thank you. Sorry, Marvina? <laughs> yes, hi. Hello everyone, hi panelists, and hello to everyone in the virtual world. My name is Marvina Edmonds, and I am by daytime, my day job, a director in strategy at Barclays, based here in New York. Essentially, I work with our executives, partner with our executives across businesses and functional groups to think through long-term initiatives to maintain our competitive advantage. In some cases, think through areas that we need to further prioritize. And well, in terms of unforeseen circumstances or unprecedented macro um, crisis, we then have to figure out how we can react immediately, insert the COVID-19 crisis, for example. Um, my passion role at the firm is I am also the co-chair of our Black Professionals Forum, which is our employee resource groups internally for our Black colleagues and allies as we think through ways to further advance the conversation and actions on inclusive and diversity. Thanks. I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Patsy? And thank you so much for including me today. I'm delighted to be here. Hello to all the panelists and all of you who are participating. So I'm Patsy Dore. I'm a Managing Director and the Global Head of Diversity and Inclusion at Credit Suisse. Uh, this is my second tour, as I say, at Credit Suisse. I was at Thomson Reuters for the prior eight years running diversity and inclusion <coughs> and social impact more broadly for the firm. And prior to that, I was <coughs> with for 10 years between New York and Hong Kong. I've spent most of my career in financial services, originally in talent development, and in the past 15 years in diversity and inclusion between living in New York, London, and Hong Kong. But I'm currently based in New York, driving this initiative, building it out to the next level. And I also sit on three boards that are dedicated to diversity and inclusion. So I'm very active in the nonprofit community as well. And again, delighted to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Patsy. Vinay? Hi, my name's Vinay Kapoor. Delighted to be joining everyone this afternoon. Um, I am the America's Head of Diversity and Inclusion for BMP Paribas. Uh, we are a bank employing just over 200,000 people headquartered in France. Um, I'm delighted to be joining you this afternoon from New York, um, but Hazi Akse may give it away. Um, I was born in uh, London and um, uh, super looking forward to a great conversation this afternoon. And finally, we have Ali back. So you want to introduce yourself to us, please? Oh, we can't hear you. I, I'm not sure if you're on mute or if we're just having problems. Okay, we'll come back to that. Hopefully we can work behind the scenes to fix that. So um, thank you all. And again, thank you for being on here today. <clears throat> for our first question, before I uh, go to our first question, we really want this to be interactive. So we're gonna kick things off with a quick poll. You should see that pop up on your screen right now. I'm asking for your views on your institution's commitment to furthering DEI. But while we're waiting for the results, we'll dive right in. As I noted in my opening remarks, and we certainly heard from Tom and Chairman Hood, as a country, as an industry, as a corporate community, and as a body politic, 
we seem to finally be feeling, to quote Dr. King, the fierce urgency of now. Marvina, from your perch as co-chair of the Barclays Black Professionals Forum and director of group strategy, what has changed? Do you think this is a moment or truly a movement? Thanks so much, Bridget. I personally do feel that we are witnessing a seismic shift in the way that we discuss diversity, inclusion, and the need for change. So I'm hopeful that it's not just a moment in time, but a lasting springboard for inclusion going forward. I think the conversations are different. It's no longer a conversation I'm having with my friends or in the BPF as part of our um, employee resource groups, or even as DNI practitioners in terms of what they can do to drive action. We're seeing commitments from the top, responses from various organizations. So that gives me hope that we're actually seeing a true change. Um, but you ask, is it different now or why now? So if I take a step back, the topic of diversity and inclusion has been permanent, I think for as long as I can remember, especially in my professional career. I really cannot recall a company I've worked for or even a client I've worked with that didn't have a DNI office or a DNI officer of some sort. Um, so we're all bankers and we're driven by data, metrics, KPIs, and targets. So let's talk some stats. If I take a step back and in preparation for this conversation did some more research. Um, so today, the black and ethnic minority population make up about close to 40% of the US population. If we translate that to representation at the top of the house CEO positions in Fortune 500, the percentage is a mere four and a half percent. It gets worse. We literally only have five, four, four black CEOs as Fortune 500 CEOs and none of them are black women. So clearly the conversation has been ongoing for a while, but there is a need to do better and to drive change. Mm. Um, so I think also, why is it different this time? For me, I think the COVID-19 pandemic in some way has been the great equalizer. Um, all of us have been impacted, whether it's through, no matter our social economic background, our gender, our race, religion, um, we've experienced changes, in some cases loss, due to the pandemic. And I think also, while we were in a quarantine environment, we plainly witnessed the brutal killings of black men, George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, and the attempted incrimination, I would say, of Christian Cooper. So we have a saying here in New York, and I'm a New Yorker now, um, if you see something, say something. But actually, my father says, it's not enough. If you see something, do something. And I think that's exactly what we're seeing now. We all literally have a role to play in driving change going forward, and the conversations include all of us. It includes the CEOs, it includes the analysts, uh, it includes the summer interns, it includes industry practitioners. Really all of us have a part to play in this message to really see lasting change. So one last plug at Barclays, one of our models is where we create opportunities to provide for clients, communities, et cetera. I do hope that through these conversations, including the one we're having today, that all of us will truly be engaged in creating opportunities for all of us to rise and equally achieve our, equally achieve our full potential. That's very inspiring and motivating. So I hope, ever, thank you. I hope everyone can see the poll results. So this is heartening. Um, my institution demonstrates commitment to furthering diversity and inclusion. We see that 54%, so I guess it would be 87% of the respondents strongly agree or somewhat disagree, or I'm sorry, or somewhat agree. So um, good work, everyone. I, I, I'd also like to add that I think, um, Please. you know, to, 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 to previous comments as well, I think that um, the, what we see also as well, and the research will support this as well, is that unlike previous generations, particularly among some millennial talent, you know, um, not prepared to absolutely accept the status quo. And, um, and, and what may have gone before, you know, and reluctantly accepting it's, it's enough is enough. And, um, and, and so what we see particularly among millennial talent as well, 
is, um, yeah, this change is needed, absolutely. Bridget, can I just add on to the comments made? Of course. I think Marvina and, and the points that she raised are, are exactly right on. I think that the data shows us that our boards are not as diverse as they need to be. Our executive level positions are not diverse. Um, in preparation for today's call, I, I was looking at the House Financial Services Committee that focuses on diversity and inclusion, and they published the statistics related to our industry. And the numbers just show, although we know that the data says that a more diverse workplace is profitable, more successful, more collaborative and inclusive, and is hand in hand with being um, revenue generating, we're not there yet. We're making some strides in some areas, but it just shows us that we haven't reached where we need to be. And I also think that the pandemic has provided an unusual environment mm -hmm. where months ago we were forced to look at our critical functions, which is typically are our businesses running and are we servicing our clients? And now we've kind of you know, crossed that threshold. Clearly we're running our businesses and we're servicing our clients. But uh, today's discussion is so fortuitous and so important because now we have the time to kind of take a step back and use our extra time that would normally be taken away by all these other activities of our lives and focus on this really important conversation and re-engage on how we really move forward with creating a diverse workplace. I think that's right. If you don't mind my jumping in as well. Um, I know we wanted to make it conversational, so I'll, yeah. I'll jump in. I think, I think that's right. I mean, I think, you know, the, the exciting thing about diversity and inclusion as a practice, and in my humble or maybe not so humble opinion anymore, is that, you know, it's really moved from, you know, years ago being kind of this risk and compliance exercise, you know, then to what was considered a soft issue, right? Mm -hmm. And then we finally got our heads around the business case, to your point, Erin, which is you know, an important step, particularly in our industry, but in all industries to really understand how it impacts profitability in the bottom line. But I think now, even before the past weeks of the tragic, tragic events that have taken place, which I also believe and agree with Marvina, are going to hopefully change the world. This is not just a moment in time. I think it's the beginning of a brand new chapter. But we've seen that organizations now, and I see this at Credit Suisse in my second tour, as I said, are focusing a lot more on the importance of belonging. So it isn't, we have to work very hard on representation and we have tons of work to do. As everybody has already said, we're nowhere near where we should be yet, but we also have to make sure that we're building out that inclusive culture to support that talent coming in mm -hmm. and to put those practices in place so that we can attract and keep the diverse talent. Mm -hmm. And, and Bridget, you know, could I add one more thing to that? <laughs> I think um, as we think about inclusive growth, inclusive culture, in financial services, we have a history of addressing our challenges, our business objectives through including various perspectives. For example, I haven't seen a deal team that only includes bankers. Every deal team has bankers, consultants, in some cases ops, in some cases legal. So clearly we value diversity of thought to make sure our business objectives achieve what we are looking to do. So I think it's the same case here when we think about diversity and inclusion. It's not a, how do you do this to make sure our company um, maybe check the box, but in terms of how we do business, diversity is critical. Otherwise, we'll miss out on, in some cases, deal making, in some cases, thoughts and ideas that could lead us to our competitive advantage. Yeah, the research is really compelling on, you know, the the um, positive impact on performance. And one thing that I think, you know, one idea behind convening this event today is an opportunity to learn from each other and share some of these best practices of, you know, goals, how do we achieve them. So I really appreciate that everybody's, you know, jumping in with their um, contributions. Mm -hmm. So Ali, we're going to try you again. Yes, it looks like you're Hi, all right. <clears throat> Hi everyone. Why yes, you yeah introduce yourself and I'll key it off with um, another question. I know that sure. RBC in 2019 was ranked as the third most diverse and inclusive global organization in the Refinity's top 100 report, which I see cited often in the uh, literature here. Can you share with us your definition of inclusion and what do you think inclusive growth means? Yeah, thank you, Bridget. And uh, uh, hi, everyone. Good day. Ali Najafi, RBC, World Bank of Canada. 
um, you know, I just feel like uh, the dialogue that we've just uh, had with our uh, panelists here, my colleagues, uh, you've actually kind of almost started to answer the same question here, you know. So I think, you know, from a uh, interpretive view, you know, inclusion in, its, in itself is a state of being valued and respected and involved. And I think that's what, you know, at its core, what we look to do is as individuals, where do we feel that we belong, that we have a, a place where we are valued and respected. And at the same time, you know, when you build um, and look at it from that individual perspective, that's how then foundationally you can grow um, as a team, as a department, as an organization. So I feel that, you know, inclusion in itself is reflected in, you know, the culture and practices of your organization. What are the programs? What are the policies? What are the, in the, in the um, initiatives that come together. So that collectively is how then inclusion starts to uh, grow and build. How is it defined? And I think this is also, you know, just what we've heard, you know, Chairman Hood mentioned some of the research and the business casing for this. Uh, and we're also hearing from Marvina and others in terms of what the stats are telling, the numbers don't lie. So obviously we know that inclusion has a long way to go. For, you know, from my personal perspective, I always feel that inclusion is that journey and it's the light at the end of the tunnel if you ever feel that you're getting very close to that light then you know it's a good thing but also maybe just check to see that you know have you missed anything uh and there's something uh not not um not not there ultimately you know when you bring all of these things together that you know it's again it's been said the business imperative is absolutely clear we, we are living in a time when there are demographic population shifts, globalization uh, has you know, become a new norm. The advances of the technology, communications, everything that we are doing now uh, as a society um, is, is, is forcing us to be um, inclusive and where inclusion does not show up, uh, we have seen that, that there, you know, there is lack of innovation, lack of creativity. So in order for, again, to be successful and again, collectively successful, diversity and inclusion is something that everybody needs to be involved with. It's not just uh, a DNI department or a center of expertise or just a few advocates or champions that are going to uh, bring this to life. This is a, uh, and it's not a, like a checkbox exercise that we've all, you know, again, everybody here on this call is, is very much in tune with. So it really means that, you know, we're going to have to have uncomfortable conversations. We're going to have to have real conversations. We're going to have to create the spaces for our colleagues, um, our clients and our communities to feel that there's a place where their voices are heard, they belong, and where we are also then going to then collectively make an impact and then change. So I think, you know, when you look at how can you do this uh, in a meaningful and impactful way is to bring that um, opportunity for people to to feel that they do have a space, and again, mm -hmm. I think then as, as the individual progresses, then you see that chain reaction in terms of progression being made, and then you know diversity of thought around the table is one aspect of it. But again, are you listening to those diverse voices? Are you including them? Um, and then you know this is how then you start to speak up for inclusion, and then being able to hold others accountable because again, as much as we you know we say. Uh, you know, it's easy to point towards these things and by no means have, you know, do we uh, ever claim that we've solved or, you know, got it. It's nice to have um, recognition from external to show and tell you that you're doing things and moving things in the right direction. Those three fingers are still always pointed back to us and we're always looking to say, like, what, what else do we need to do? What, what can we do? What should we do? So I think that's where we can collectively uh, make it uh, make an impact. And, and at the end of the day, you know, diversity is a fact. Inclusion is a choice. So if you're going to make that choice, you're going to have to go all in and, and figure out what to do. You know, that's you're really echoing some of the early comments about the importance of, you know, belonging, really being yes. a part of integrated all the way through. Does anyone else want to comment on? Um, yeah. Marvina? So I think, Bridget and Ali, thank you for that. I think another piece, in terms of driving inclusion, it really does require action. So it is an active participation to get the end result that we need of closing the gap. So for example, if you're a leader in um, your respective organization with a position of power to make a difference, sponsor someone. Sponsor a high potential talent that you can bring them to the table, bring them to the conversation so that they can actually be 
part of that inclusive discussion we just talked about. Um, so I do think, I do agree that yes, we have a long way to go, but if we're not all actively participating, sponsoring others, mentoring others, bringing others along the journey, creating opportunities and seats at the table, then it will be more um, theoretical than actionable. So a sheer example of that, and I can't say if this is correctly or true, but um, Richard Howarth um, in the US, he's our CEO of the Americas, but also vice chair of the IIB. So I wouldn't be surprised if when in the planning committee with you, Bridget and others, we were trying to think through, well, who do we bring for the panel discussion? He probably thought, well, who can I think about internally? Let me probably volunteer Marvina, another mm -hmm. way of creating opportunities to then drive that change. And I think a lot of us and a lot of our senior leaders can do that and actively drive those conversations. Yeah, I think Mar Marvina, you were voluntold <laughs> to be a part of the panel today. Correct, correct. <laughs> and I, and I, uh, I, I, so I, lucky I, to have someone like Richard leading the IIB and your organization and so committed. I mean, you know, Tom here today, we really see that commitment from um, the IIB leaders. Anyone else? Sure, yeah, I'm happy I, to. Oh, go ahead. No, oh, thank you. You're too kind. I was going to say sponsorship absolutely is essential. It's absolutely essential as well. And it's um, moving away from, from the mentoring muscle that, you know, that can often get flexed sometimes, but moving it more to active sponsorship. And organic sponsorship is always, is always best. And, you know, it's um, providing air cover, providing air cover for talent in order to thrive in the organization as well. And I think it's also reframing sponsorship as well, that it's not a one-way street, you know, that there's, that there's benefits and dividends for the sponsor as well as the sponsee as well. But I think the, you know, the sponsee does need to signal that they are ready to be sponsored as well. So I think that there needs to be a reframing of what sponsorship is and what it isn't. And it's definitely not mentoring. It's not uh, Friday afternoon, three o'clock, let's go for coffee and I'll give you some advice. It's much more active, taking real um, insight and accountability for somebody else's uh, you know, career trajectory as well. So it's, I think it's absolutely you know, essential to embed uh, sponsorship into, into, it, into talent management, into the way that organizations run, you know, and um, so yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I would absolutely agree with that statement. They always say the difference between sponsorship and mentorship, right, is the sponsor is someone who talks about you when you're not in the room. Is there, is there an advocate? And that's, that's so important. I would also add that I think it's, and it was mentioned earlier, albeit, albeit briefly, that it's important to A, role model these behaviors, B, call out things, microaggressions, micro inequities when we see them and in the moment and role model that behavior by calling them out and creating an opportunity for others to do the same, particularly if you're in a more senior position, so that others feel comfortable calling behaviors out. And then I would finally add one of the things that, that we at Credit Suisse, and I, I know we're not alone in this at all, are heavily focused on is courageous conversations, right? So giving people the resources and the toolkit and the culture to have courageous, open dialogue and real conversations about diversity and inclusion. You know, whether you're black, white, gay, however the case may be, being able to call those things out and have a conversation that's meaningful. But we really need to do that in the right way as well and to educate our leaders and our employees on how to best do that in a positive, productive way. And we have a, we have a global campaign going on about that right now. And that really is all about what everybody has mentioned in some way, shape or form, taking that very active role, but then having the culture supported at the same time. Yeah, those can be uncomfortable conversations and having the tools and some coaching about how to approach them is really valuable. Yeah, um, this has been, a, I see some, you know, that's where some of the biggest growth can happen as well, in some of those uncomfortable conversations. And I think this is, you know, this is a great growth opportunity as well for, for, for everyone, for individuals as well. And, you know, we rolled out unconscious bias training using live, live porn theater case studies and, you know, for all, you know, 4,000 staff and, and, you know, and that provided the opportunity to start having some of those conversations because that's where um, we, can, we can really raise the empathy of what it's like to walk in the shoes of somebody else and, um, and, and, you know, and understand their experiences, at least empathize with their experiences to raise the empathy levels up 
um, to help us become better colleagues in, uh, within the organization. Great. You know, I was going to say for Vinay and Patsy's uh, comments around that uh, uncomfortable conversations, you know, we call them, uh, you know, courageous as well. And also like, you know, again, the speak up for inclusion is where we, you know, have over the past 24 months have been pushing, uh, you know, our agenda both internally and externally to bring uh, those dialogues to the forefront because it really does, you know, it does require leaders to acknowledge, you know, what uh, are the, all the voices in the room being um, uh, heard? Are they being sought after? And, and again, that's how actually, and again, similar to, uh, you know, what Credit Suisse is doing on a, on a global campaign in terms of uh, educating and sharing those resources, we've done the same with our Speak Up for Inclusion series. So again, when you go to our website, you can see the videos and the learning resources that help uh, navigate those conversations through to like enable people to have them but then also what do you do afterwards because it's again the learning moments are great but it's really the action pieces that have to be almost 365 because otherwise again it's this can cannot be ever a, a once and done exercise at a moment in time obviously that we're in you know socially politically right now again the the, the action has to just be uh, continuous and, and we just have to continue pushing the agenda, you know, despite what all the other noise that's, uh, that's around us, uh, you know, from a business or from a uh, cultural or from a societal perspective, uh, these, are, these are times that we just have to keep continue pushing forward. Great. Um, and I, just two sort of logistical questions. I want to, um, I know a lot of people are participating via phone only. Obviously, you can't see our panelists, nor could you see the um, poll results, but we're recording this session, so you'll be able to watch it uh, later if there's, you know, something, a uh, particular portion that you want to um, watch versus just hear. And also, we're getting some good, great questions in through the Q&A icon on Zoom. We encourage more, and I want to make sure that we leave time for those. Um, so we'll just, you know, continue here. But I want to encourage people to submit questions. Like I said, we'll get through as many as we can today. And if we don't, another good reason to convene this group for a, for a subsequent session. Um, so next, I wanted to um, kind of talk about foreign banks. Um, you know, on the one hand, we might think that foreign banks would be more sensitive to the value of diversity. I mean, after all, we are foreign banks. On the other hand, Tom talked about how there can be sort of a maybe a disconnect between home office and U.S. office views around what diversity, equality, and inclusion means. Um, Aaron, your thoughts, how might foreign banks be different from other organizations that face these issues? Thanks, Bridget. Sure. I think that there's opportunity and challenges for U.S. branches of foreign banks in this space. Certainly, we find that value sets, um, cultures, and priorities for diversity and inclusion may be set by the home office, not in the U.S., and the conversations that they're having around their diversity and inclusion initiatives may be different from ours here. So where our challenge is, is to take that same value set and those priorities and look at our local environment and what needs to be addressed and look for opportunities to create our own footprint and encourage diversity within our local workplaces. Being a U.S. branch of a foreign bank um, also presents additional opportunity for us based on our size. So for us at NAB at, in the New York office, we're an office of 125 employees roughly. What this translates to is a more broad base of employees involved deeply in advocating and supporting diverse communities and causes and finding that this is not only encouraged, but it's nurtured. So whether it's our culture club, which is a diverse group of employees that address uh, educating the branch about different cultures and backgrounds and ethnicities to our CSR committee, which has a mission that is broad based and includes the LBGTQ community causes, um, we're finding that it's not concentrated. We're finding that there's more inclusive involvement in a, in a cause like this. Great. We have a question that popped up that's really right on topic to um, the discussion around sponsorship, mentorship. So I, I'm gonna pop that one in here now. Um, our attendee asks, sponsorship is great and necessary, but relies heavily on individuals stepping up and taking risk. 
Do you think incentives or specific targets and measurements for senior leaders or managers related to DEI help sustain these actions for longer term changes? It seems like there needs to be some level of accountability, but wondering your thoughts on the best way to approach. Who wants to take that up? I don't mind spotting that one since I kind of introduced the sponsorship yeah. notion in the way I think Richard Howard has been very successful. I think first and foremost, we as individuals or um, diverse talent um, as a black woman, we first have to show up because if we're asking to be sponsored by senior executives to make a seat at the table, then are we already demonstrating, driving and showing the, the necessary steps to achieve that long-term position that we are trying to achieve. So if you're not already committing in your current day job, are you already um, hitting the marks and sometimes exceeding the expectations, then yes, it might become a risk as the um, user puts it to have someone sponsor you. But to me, if you're a high potential individual, you're already making um, strides, you're already delivering against commitments and results, you're making deals, you're getting things done, you're driving to results, you just happen to be an ethnic minority talent, then it's a no risk sponsorship in my opinion. But is there a way to encourage others to step up and um, do the right thing? Then yes, I do agree that any um, incentives from the top that drives to accountability, that showcases that yes, it's not just lip service, but as an organization, we do value and promote diversity, so we encourage and create platforms, programs, sessions that facilitate the sponsorship. Um, it makes it an easier conversation to have. But I do put the onus on us as well to then show up and deliver so that it's not a risk-taking sponsorship opportunity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'll, I'll add to Marvina's comments there that, you know, we, again, it's, it's individual, but it's leaders. But it's also, you know, again, it's coming back to, you know, overall business uh, driving forward and being innovative and, and uh, ahead of the, uh, the rest of, you know, who's out there. And, and from a market perspective, you want to be an employer of choice. You want to be a destination that employees today have a lot of, you know, opportunity in terms of they get to decide, you know, which company, which offer they want to take. And so, again, it's going to be about, um, you know, less about a uh, tracking or a measurement or setting a, a goal perspective, but you need to obviously measure what's there, but our, ultimately also our clients collectively are asking that, you know, we want to deal with an institution that we can reflect and see um, ourselves, you know, uh, being engaged with. So, again, I think, you know, clients and institutional uh, clients, investors, they are all asking these questions today. Is that, do you reflect the markets that you serve? Um, is that representation there? And so this comes back to, you know, creating that talent pipeline, having uh, programs and initiatives that will advance and ramp up the opportunity for individuals to actually be sponsored. So again, yes, you have to be, you know, um, uh, do a little bit more to get maybe to, you know, from the bridge between mentorship and sponsorship. But at the same time, I think this is you know incumbent again on on all sides to be able to push that much further. But again, also look to see that you know is is your workforce reflective uh, of the market that you're serving. Mm. And I would add, um, I think part of the question as well, in addition to sponsorship, as I heard it at least, was how do you hold people accountable? Right? Accountable. Yep. Yeah. So at, so sort of taking that concept up a bit to a more macro level, you know, I think sponsorship, in, in my opinion, is part of a broader umbrella of inclusive leadership. Right. So what does it mean to be an inclusive leader who knows how to build and lead diverse teams? And I think that incorporates a number of things, one of which is sponsorship, doing it yourself and role and role modeling that behavior. Another is the courageous conversations we've spoken about. Another is ensuring that across the entire employee life cycle from recruitment to development, to engagement and retention, that there are mechanisms in place that as leaders and as organizations, that we have mechanisms and therefore measurement in place to hold our leaders accountable, ultimately through the performance management system or otherwise, but that there are at the end of the day, measurements in place to ensure that we are doing those things, doing them effectively, and ultimately being held accountable in terms of our performance rating and compensation at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. So that leads right into a, um, one of the other questions that an attendee uh, submitted 
And they say, my firm indicates that they are limited to what they can do to address structural racism, as in investing more resources to address increasing representation of certain underrepresented groups, because data does not reflect the true demographics. Employees often do not self-identify as people of color in their employee profile. If that is the case at other firms, any suggestions on how you address this challenge? Well, I, for me, I think um, a, a lack of self-identification, uh, you know, that percentage of staff who are not declaring or not self-identifying self is also a, a number as well. And, and it's not just focusing on the number that I have, but it's also the number that I haven't. Mm -hmm. and, and digging deep into why not? And what does that mean? And um, where's that coming from? And is it, do we need to look at reinforcing communications? Is there a trust issue? How's this data going to be used, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I would also be, you know, not, not just focusing on, on how many have, but how many haven't. That's a data point as well. And um, I, I think there's various tactics and, and methods to look at that. But I think, um, you know, trust, organizational trust would be the, would be the, would be the biggest one to say, you know, what, how is this data going to be used? Mm -hmm. And maybe another just, point, Renee. Oh, go ahead, Ali. No, please, Marvina, go ahead. Then I'll go after you. I think what I was going to add here is, I think it's bringing it back to when we talk about DNI, it's not a cultural topic, it's a business challenge. Um, if today we decide we want to enter a new market, a new region, and the data is a bit obscure, opaque, but we believe there's an opportunity to succeed, we wouldn't just back away and say, well, I can't figure it out, I give up, right? We would actually try to under uncover what resources do I need to identify the gap? What does the data really tell me? What is the opportunity? It's the same thing, in my opinion, putting my strategy hat on when we think about DNI. So if the data is currently not as, um, as integ the integrity of the data is questionable, then maybe to your point, it's what can we do to make it more apparent and more clear as to the objectives that the company and the organization is trying to achieve. If ultimately we believe that organization or that objective is necessary, we can all then contribute to achieve that goal. So it's not a DNI topic or an issue, it's a business challenge, just like any other deal making, product manufacturing, product entry strategy that we would prioritize. Thank you. I was, Patsy, I was just going to add quickly that, you know, both from Marvina and Vinay's uh, comments that they made, um, you know, it, it's also that in, in question of getting the numbers and the data, it's, it also helps to inform, as Marvina said, the company and decision making process. So, you know, by, you know, communicating and I think, I think this is where transparency is very important for organizationally to let, you know, your colleagues and employees know that this is the information that's needed to also help drive things forward. So again, with the absence of not knowing, uh, it's absolutely incumbent that, you know, you do need to do that, uh, that digging and that investigating to get underneath to figure out what is it, because obviously you will know collectively that obviously that if the numbers are not there, then there, there's something missing. So there's a reason why people are not willing to share. So it goes back to that you know, sense of belonging that if they're not willing to, you know, identify or even, you know, provide something, there are some other things that you need to start looking at and asking questions around that these, these are, you know, opportunities that we need to uncover because that, again, in order for us to move forward, we need to know, you know, what, what the current um, uh, lay of the land is. So I think, again, the communication aspect of this is, uh, is very important, the transparency in terms of where and how all of these data, because again, yeah, numbers and the business casing is all there. And, and this is how you continue to make an impact and a change that not only your employees will see, but again, outside, you know, looking in, uh, clients and the communities get to look at to say, okay, the, the company is actually trying to and looking to make a difference. And does the organizational climate support providing that information? Yeah. So Marvin has often um, kind of brought the business strategy, thinking of this the way you would think about a business. We heard Chairman Hood um, and, and many of you talk about, you know, the importance of um, inclusion, customers, and uh, the markets you serve. Patsy, do you think the financial services industry has an advantage along with its clear responsibility uh, to drive change in corporate America, to promote 
inclusion, given its connection to all businesses, you know, large, small, different sectors of the economy? Yeah, abs thank you for that. Um, absolutely. I, I think 100% for all of those reasons, because we do have access to, to so many different parties or around the globe, um, industry agnostic, etc. Um, I would add a couple thoughts to that, which are slightly divergent, but related. Um, number, number one, um, I tend to think about the fact that it used to be, right, that diversity and inclusion as a concept and as a cultural imperative was actually an advantage, right? And now it's a business imperative. You, know, you must, I mean, to the point that I think Ali made earlier, you know, it's the talent that we have in the organization that we're trying to keep, the talent we're trying to attract. We know eight out of 10 millennials make their decisions on where they work based on how serious the company takes social impact in the broad sense of the word. It's our clients. Clients are not looking for, and this is mentioned earlier, you know, a, a non-diverse deal team to work with. They want a, t a deal team to be representative of who they are. And then the investor community, and there's a particular opportunity for us as an industry you know, with the rise of impact investing and growing at about 20, 25% a year, you know, a multi-trillion dollar industry, there's a real opportunity for us to really get involved in terms of education around ESG, environmental social governance data, the importance of that data, how that measures the work that we're doing, um, but the importance of that data as well as it applies to investing. Um, someone mentioned earlier the Refinitiv Index, I think, uh, and actually that came out of Thomson Reuters. And without sounding funny, my team developed that index with our, our head of ESG because we thought it was an opportunity. And that was at Thomson Reuters, not a bank, obviously, but servicing financial services. We thought it was an opportunity for us to use that data. And I think we have access to that same data in financial services, but we also have the opportunity to create products off of that data too. And that's certainly unique to our industry, whether it's an ETF or otherwise. And so I think that's also an opportunity for us. So it's A, it's about the access to different parties around the world, industry agnostic. B, it's the access to data, particularly ESG in this case. And C, it's the opportunity to create products and client practices that really impact the business. We've gotten several questions. You know, you all have talked about data. And um, I know that there's always sort of this tension about, you know, resistance to data collection and, and targets um, kind of institutionally, but you all have certainly indicated how important that is. Any comments, you know, some other questions we've gotten about diversity targets, um, inclusion mm -hmm. targets, you know, hard numbers where you're gonna, um, uh, have that sort of goal and perhaps accountability. Mm, I'm happy to share that. Yeah, absolutely. From from the top of the organisation, absolutely. You know, targets around DNI are part of our leadership profile, and you know, and it's you know not quotas, but targets. And it's it's clear because um, we can measure progress uh, or any potential backsliding. That's the only way we can. Yes, yeah, it's one of the few ways that we can actually measure progress in the in, in, when it comes to DNI, and it's so essential to be able to, you know, to demonstrate progress as well, as well as what you can see as well. But um, yes, absolutely, targets. And I think the absence of targets maybe kind of lead us to where we are today. The fact that, as I mentioned earlier in the intro, if there is not one black woman as a CEO of a Fortune 500 company, maybe one target is have one, right? Um, I think the ideal state is we need to be representative of the population in which we operate. And that's not necessarily saying a quota or um, numbers for the sake of numbers, but it's doing what's right. There is no reason why a population that makes up close to 20% of the entire um, demographic um, barely shows up at the top of the house. So if we think of it that way, um, that these targets or these objectives or these goals are to get us closer to a fair representation, then I think we, get, we move away from the notion of we're establishing quotas, but we're actually driving to the change that's necessary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I would say, uh, you know, in echoing all those statements is, you know, ultimately what gets measured gets, uh, is what gets done. We hold to the same accountability on the business side when we need to deliver, you know, bottom 
bottom line results, you know, whichever, you know, function and uh, line of business you're representing in your organization. And it's the same thing on the talent. Again, the war for talent is, you know, immense and, and you need to be able to be like, you know, look to see, do we, are we getting not only the what's available from a market share perspective, but are you happy with what you've got? Because you will know that you either underrepresented or, you know, ideally you want to be in a place where, you know, people are looking towards, well, that's the destination I want to be at because that's the company I want to be involved with and work with and come to. And so ultimately as an organization, you want to be looking to see that, you know, if you're underrepresented in any segment or any particular component, then again, what is it you're going to do? And that also then lends itself to asking other questions. So, you know, absolutely, you know, without the numbers and again, you know, uh, but not being able to show, you know, where you are, uh, you will again very be very quickly held accountable by your shareholders, by your clients, and by your employees in terms of we we do not see that representation. So what are we going to do? And without embedding leadership accountability in, I think you know we'd, we'll always say the you know awareness and education level, and you know never making it to the next level, which in, and education and awareness is absolutely important, um, but we have to take it to the next level, absolutely. You know, what, as I mentioned at the outset, um, a major goal of this, um, this event is to have some actionable advice and some things we can take back for further uh, discussion and exploration. And I think the, this concept of data collection, targets, how you determine these targets and goals might be something that would really lend itself to um, to a round two, really helpful to, to learn from one another. Um, Vinay, you clearly are passionate about what you do. Um, can you talk to us about the role um, that advocacy plays, um, you know, sort of mm. your Position is an advocate. This isn't just your job. You're an advocate for diversity and inclusion. Mm. Talk about that. I, I, absolutely. So, um, at a personal level, absolutely, being an advocate for for change and for diversity and inclusion, and you know, and I think organisations have a role to play as well. You know, as part of our DNI strategies, we are, you know, environment and making a positive impact on the uh, on the environment in the communities in which we operate. Uh, is part of our DNI strategies, and and as part of that, you know, a case study I can show is <coughs> about a year ago we signed an amicus brief at the U.S. Supreme Court uh, in support of LGBT plus workplace protections for all Americans, not just within Bibi Power, but for all Americans across across all the states. And you know, there were you know there were some questions, you know, um, why is a foreign bank, you know, get, you know, um, uh, you know. Why, petitioning the US Supreme Court, you know, particularly when our employment policies were already enhanced and, and, and provided full coverage anyway. But, you know, what, what this, is, this is, and this is the role for me, you know, of organizations. It's about using the might and, and, and that we have as an organization to be advocates for social change. Um, and so we were delighted to, 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 to sign that, uh, the amicus brief, because what it speaks to is our values. And our values are global. Our values are in every, every jurisdiction in which we operate in. And that's what drove our decision, that these are part of our values and that we will absolutely support a, a coalition of, of, of organizations. And we were one of 200 organizations here in the US um, that signed that because we've heard and we're delighted that, that, that just very recently, it's a few days ago, the US Supreme Court agreed and, and, and passed the historic ruling that it did in favor of um, LGBT plus workplace protections. And, and so that for me is, is a case study of how organizations can become advocates for change. And, and even as a foreign bank, you know, as a, you know, headquartered in France, you know, people may be saying, well, what's, you know, this is, you know, uh, how, how does this relate to, you know, your headquarters are in a different country, but our values are global. So we are fast approaching 3.30. <laughs> I wish we had made this be longer. Um, and I have one important housekeeping piece, CLE code 91431. Again, that's 91431. I have, we have an important closer, both I think to help um, to, to close out this event, but also, as I mentioned, give us some direction about how we can move forward. And that's, I'd like to ask each of you, you've, you've thrown out a lot of really great suggestions, um, but 
if we could ask each of you to share one action item, your single best recommendation for a concrete, tangible action that you could recommend to attendees today who, like you, are eager to advance their institutions and FBOs on a path towards full diversity, equality, and inclusion. So, Erin, how about we start with you? Sure, thanks, Bridget. So today we've talked about accountability, data, inclusive workplaces, recruitment practices, and retaining talent. Recruiting diversity is one thing, but retaining diversity is even more important. Creating an environment where all individuals are valued and there is opportunity for everyone to advance is critical. In every organization that I've worked for, change starts at the top, and that remains true at NAB, both globally and on a local basis. We're seeing real sustainable change when there is executive sponsorship of DNI programs, where the executive sponsor promotes awareness of that particular program, actively supports and advocates for resources and a focus to that program, and the sponsorship is a component of that person's end of year scorecard, which ties back to their end of year remuneration. So for us, it's whatever that executive sponsor is passionate about, what they want to get involved in, um, it's individual sponsorship, you know, including younger talent of a diverse background in those causes, and sustainable change, which is demonstrated through the metrics that we make available. Great. Patsy? Sure. Um, so it won't be one thing, but I'll try to keep it short in the interest of time. I'd say, um, you know, as a practitioner, for those in the audience who are practitioners or advocates of any type, um, three things. And all of this has come up in some way, shape, or form, but, but really this balance between diversity as representation and inclusion as culture and really creating that sense of belonging. I see a lot of organizations in my experience over focus on one aspect or the other, and that doesn't work. I mean, I always say you can hire a whole bunch of diverse talent, but if the culture doesn't support it, they're gonna leave, so it's not gonna work. So you've gotta always have that ongoing balance and at different times it plays a different role. And similar to that concept, make sure that you're looking across the entire employee life cycle all the time. So not just recruitment, not just development, not just engagement, but the entire life cycle and have the metrics in place accordingly and the programming as well. And then finally, I always think it's important, and we talked about this a bit earlier, where diversity used to be seen almost as a soft issue, you know, run it as a business. It is a business. And several people on my fine panelists here have mentioned that it's a business challenge mm -hmm. and we need to keep saying that and be at the table as part of the strategy so the diversity is part of how our businesses operate. And then actually I have a fourth point. Sorry, I said three, but I've got four. I think the, the, the external voice of corporations, as I think Finay and Ali mentioned as well, is absolutely critical. I think it is our role and our responsibility as corporations, as well as as individuals to have an active voice externally as well. That's great, thank you. Welcome. Those were four worthwhile, so it's fine that you can know. <laughs> Good. Oh gosh, I, 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 there's so many, and then there's, I, I, I don't know what to, add, what to add to that fantastic list. I think um, one recognize the, the 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 strength of the employee voice within your organisation, and secondly, I'd say um, collaborate. <laughs> to everyone on the panel and, 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 and to all the panelists joining and um, to all the people joining this, this fantastic conversation, I say collaborate. No one's going to be sorted, no one's going to get there alone. Together, stronger. And so collaboration, reaching out as an industry, we can make great strides and, uh, and continue to build on, on, on the great work we're doing already. But I think it's um, uh, collaboration, absolutely key. This, this is going to take everyone and we can do it. That's great. Marvina? Yes, I would echo what everyone's already said. It's absolutely a business challenge. And I think as we look forward to kind of keep that mindset in mind, which requires business commitment, tone from the top and resources, financial and otherwise, to achieve the objective. Um, and then we already talked about data. But I guess I would say to everyone else on the call, just remember to be, or, or listening to us here, be an active ally, be an active participant in that process. Um, don't just wait for your CEO, your DNI executives to give you the playbook, but also be active in participating in that conversation in your immediate teams, in your line management hierarchy, where you can drive change in your own world. 
Um, and maybe just one more thing to the other um, fellow colleagues of ethnic minority descent um, also watching this, for, for us to continue to show up. As I mentioned earlier, while we definitely do require demand, agree to get some sponsorship and mentoring to achieve and close the gap, it's also on us to, to do the work, to get the job done, to make, um, to make the case for closing the gap. And last, we'll hear from Ali. Thank you, Bridget, and thanks to all my fellow panelists as well. Um, you know, I would say inclusive leadership, uh, you know, diversity, inclusion, bias uh, for, for everyone. These are still very challenging topics. And I think, you know, the best way to navigate through these is, uh, you know, through honest, open conversation. We're asking our colleagues, our employees, uh, you know, to bring their whole selves to work every day, be genuine, be authentic. Uh, and that should be something that, you know, they have a right to expect inclusive leadership in return. Uh, and then, you know, quite simply, you know, in order for us to speak uh, up for inclusion, we have to speak about inclusion and it's going to be uncomfortable. Sometimes it might be challenging, but, you know, the, the end state is, is going to be extremely rewarding on so many levels. And, you know, Marvin has mentioned it and everyone, all my other panelists have said the same thing, that it's everybody's role. You know, diversity and inclusion is everyone's job. It's not a center of expertise. It's not a uh, unique niche department that's sitting, you know, tucked away in HR and you kind of brush off when there's something that you need to talk about. It's a shared responsibility. Um, everybody uh, across the organization, top down, bottom up, has a role to play. And, uh, you know, we all need to take a genuine interest in the conversation, the dialogue, and ultimately in taking action, because uh, at the end of the day, complacency is not okay. It's not acceptable. And we just have to, like, you know, like dig in uh, and, and do the right things. And, you know, collectively, we'll be able to get there. Great. So we've come to the end of our program today. I wanna to thank our panelists, Chairman Hood, Tom, for all you're doing now and have done throughout your careers to help our institutions and industries do more and do better. I wanna thank everyone who joined us today, showing that you really care about this issue. You've all issued um, some very concrete call to action. And so I think now it's time for us to get to work. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Bye-bye. Take care. Thank everyone. you, everyone. Bye-bye.